You're playing King Arthur wrong. Okay, maybe not you, maybe just the guy next to you. It's quite a bold title, obviously. I just wanted to address this thing that's going around at the moment, which is a lot of complaints about King Arthur being bad in one way or another. It's saying that he's weak in one regard, that he's just useless, or that he needs changes, and all that kind of stuff. And I think that a lot of these claims just come from not enough experience with King Arthur and maybe not quite having found the playstyle for him, and that's what I want to address today. In this context, I want to make it clear that I don't think I figured out everything about King Arthur yet, or that I'm some god-given talent at King Arthur or something. I just really enjoy playing King Arthur, and I really looked deep into his mechanics in multiple past videos already, you can check those out as well, for more specific interactions with items and his abilities and such. And ever since then I've kept playing him, I've learned more about the character, and as such I think I have a decent understanding of how to play him effectively. I'm not saying everything here will work every game, I've obviously lost some games as well, but my win-loss ratio with him is like with any other guard that I've played for a longer time and am more experienced with, and when I won I was typically pretty ahead in multiple regards, so it gives me the impression that King Arthur is definitely a strong guard and that many people are undervaluing him. And with that, let's get into the complaints or the issues that people have with Arthur and address them one by one. The first one, he is very clunky and his AA cancels are clunky. Yes, that is absolutely the case, that is an issue with him, especially the fact that sometimes ability animations get completely cancelled out and it's very, very irritating. That one we will talk a bit more about towards the end because it's a very specific mechanics thing when it comes to his basic attack and movement, but overall this is one of the issues that he has and you just have to get used to it. There are some workarounds with a specific combo that I'll get into later, but yeah, that's an issue that's there. The second point is the claim that his defense is low. I don't know where this started and I think this impression is very misleading. We can compare King Arthur's base stats to some other warriors here. He starts with 475 HP and then plus 80, that is the same as Tyr or slightly more than Amaterasu who scales up with 82. He has 17 physical defense and gets 3 per level, Amaterasu gets 18 plus 3, Tyr has 15 plus 3 and they all share the magical defense of 30 plus 0.9. So he is as tanky as other mobile warriors, such as Amaterasu and Tyr. At the same time, he obviously doesn't feel as tanky as those two. And why is that? Because they have self-sustain and he doesn't. You can counteract that quite easily by fitting a Gladiator's shield into your build, where he's a lot of ways of proccing that. But there's another good reason why King Arthur has these base stats and not incredibly high ones. He is the only warrior with 4 movement abilities in his kit. They're not all super fast movement abilities, but his 2 in combo stance, both stance of the 3 and his charged ultimate are all movement abilities. So if he was super tanky at the same time, he would simply be OP because he would be super mobile and would just never die because he's tanky on top of that. Still he's very far away from being a squishy guard. The next complaint is that his burst is too low. I don't think that is the case, and this is where the combo comes in, I will bring this up quite a few times through this video. So I initially thought that having blink on King Arthur would be a bit of a waste because he has so much mobility, but especially when you're playing jungle King Arthur, blink in my opinion is almost a must. Not only does it synergize with his escapes very well, you create a little bit of distance and blink can come up because you're out of the fight for long enough and then you have much longer distance, but it also sets up excellent ganks with this combo. What you want to do is you want to be in your combo stance already. So if you aren't yet, just use your 3 in defensive stance or your 2 in defensive stance so you get into the combo stance. And then what you want to do is ideally you blink over a wall towards a target and you use your 2 in combo stance immediately. So they will be knocked up. Then while they're knocked up, you use your 1. This secures the amplified close range damage of the standard stance 1. Then you probably chain in a basic attack most of the time and then you use the combo stats one. At this point, the enemy will have taken a lot of damage. You can really chunk down their health. This can actually set up for a lot of first bloods in mid lane especially, so saying his burst is too low is really not true when this combo remains strong for the rest of the game. And after that obviously you have the rest of your abilities to set up even more. You have the slows, you have your shreds, you have your dashes to swing even harder after that. So really this is not a non-bursty guard. How you actually end up not being bursty is by using the standard stance one at long range, that's a complete waste of this unless you're clearing with it or you have no way to get close to the enemy, 
or if you're trying to hard engage with your combo stance three first, which a lot of people still do, because that way your damage becomes way too predictable and it's way too slow, it ticks down before it even happens. And that makes you a low burst god. But that doesn't mean that if you play him right, he's a low burst god, because he's got this self setup for a lot of immediate damage. The next complaint is that his DPS sucks. Yeah, he's an ability-based warrior. His DPS is supposed to suck. Ability-based warriors have quick bursts and then some abilities afterwards if they're lucky, but they're not supposed to have high DPS, high damage per second through continuous basic attacks. If you want to have high DPS, you play a hunter, not a warrior. So yes, his DPS sucks and that's good. Then there's the whole conversation of jungle versus solo and people say that apparently he's terrible in jungle. I've almost exclusively played him in jungle and I have to give that a hard disagree. I think he's very, very strong in jungle, possibly stronger in jungle than in solo from what I've heard from solo laners so far who think that he's not that great, because in jungle he is absolutely great. Some of the very useful items for him are a little bit less accessible in solo and he has to go into some more tanky items most of the time, which I think is a bit of a downside of solo, but at the same time he still can get his most important items there, so really, no, I don't think it's an issue either way. Another small benefit of playing him in jungle is also that he has multiple dashes to get back to the phoenix at least very very quickly, so you can rotate back in quicker after going back if you go out of mana. Then there's the complaint about his clear. I don't know where that's coming from. If you max the one, you should have no issue clearing. His jungle clear right now is one of the best ones in the game. He can literally one-shot camps if you're just a little bit ahead. So yeah, just use the one to clear and you're fine. For some reason, a lot of people seem to think that Mystical Mail is a good item on him. I am not sure where that's coming from, especially with Void Shield being so present and right in your face for a god like this. But I think if you're building Mystical Mail on him in most situations, you're actually hindering him as a character. He's got so much base damage and decent amount of scaling behind his abilities, so why would you be going for a ticking damage item that kind of supplements guards that normally don't have that much damage? I'm not saying there are no situations, but I don't think it should be a preferred choice most of the time, especially since CDR also works pretty well with him. When it comes to advice, some people recommend using the knock-up to set up the ultimate, and I really don't understand that. King Arthur's knock-up is excellent to set up the one, which is a lot of guaranteed immediate damage, and the ultimate really doesn't require much setup, at least not the enhanced version. The first version is a little bit hard to hit sometimes because of this weird forward movement, but in either case you shouldn't really use your 2 for that unless your 1 is already down anyways, as that will be the much more beneficial setup in most situations. Another thing people don't seem to be aware of, not so much a complaint, is that the 3 actually gives you knockup immunity and is not affected by slows at all. So for the entire duration of the 3, you can avoid a lot of CC coming your way, unless it's something harder like a stun or a silence specifically. But in many situations, you can use it like a Thor 3, for example, and just counteract an enemy's knockup ult entirely. And that is something that you should make use of if you want to play him as effectively as possible, which is another reason to primarily use the one for damage. Quite some people seem to have issues with his casting times as well, uh, or sometimes mention the animation of the one as an issue because you're not going forward as fast as you're going with pretty much everything else. These things are pretty necessary in my opinion. Otherwise, it would be almost impossible to interrupt him in what he's doing and he would just demolish everyone completely. And again, if you use the combo of the two knockup into the one, then most of the things won't be an issue for you because you're setting yourself up, the enemy is knocked up so they can do absolutely nothing against it and yeah, you get your damage through. Something some people are not aware of yet are the interactions between his basic attacks and cripples or roots. Because while you cannot use your other dashes to get out of them, you can use your basic attacks to move forward while being in a lockdown state through a cripple or even a root. This may not be fully intended, especially with the root, this may be changed, but especially when it comes to cripples, you can still leap out of a whirlpool that way sometimes, and that can save your life, so use it. A lot of people are complaining about the upgraded ultimate and the fact that enemies can walk out of that almost preemptively, and I'm actually one of those people. I think that's annoying, I think that's not how it should work. He's kind of locked in his animation while the enemy can walk away, and that is an issue. Likewise, he can still be hit by certain abilities in air, for example, by Baron Sumdi's ult. 
but also enemies that are kind of caught in the combo can somewhat easily be hit by allies' abilities considering how early they drop down. So I think the ult as a whole just needs some more checks in regards to the banish interaction and how long both parties should be in the air and what can actually hit them there. A main complaint from many many players is that his energy gain is too slow and that it resets up on death. I honestly think that's fine. Even if you don't have your ultimate, you still have six other abilities. And when you hit those six abilities, you should at least get enough energy for your default ult. So most of the time, you will have at least one ult. Not always a supercharged one, but you don't always have to have that super damage because the rest of his kit is strong enough on its own for that not to be an issue at all. And if it's up, then even better. Now in that context, also regarding the usage of the ult, because I said that the ult in its current state is kind of bad, I would recommend either using it when you have an ally nearby that can follow up immediately after the ult with some sort of damage or CC to punish the enemy the moment they drop down, or use it when an enemy is so low that you will be able to completely execute them with it. I like to actually save the ult for tanks quite a lot, so that I can shred a lot of their percentage health with the true damage and then have my team collapse on them afterwards and burn the tank before the fight even starts, when my ult is already charged. Many people seem to think that both Arthur's early and mid game are bad. I do agree that his early game is not the best, especially in solo. The first levels are a little bit rough until you have your abilities, this is something that I already said on PTS basically and that hasn't changed, but that's fine. Again, if you are playing it smart, you can get a very early first blood with him anyways, I explained how earlier. And also, I think that his mid game is definitely not bad at all. I think that the moment you have your core items, he is very very strong and even before that he can often dish out a lot of damage and get a few cheeky kills here and there. Then there's the issue of King Arthur crashing games. Yep, that's an issue. Don't ult Fafnir in his ult form because otherwise your game will crash entirely and apparently there's some issues with Sobek as well. That's not good. Then there's something that somebody on Twitter pointed out to me today that I thought was interesting. I haven't tried it yet, I've been considering to try it. And after looking at the numbers a little bit more, I, I want to try it a little more. So like I said, the 3 is not necessarily your main damaging tool. I like to have the 3 up after my entire combo, because when the enemy can't get away and they use their escapes, it's very nice to just chunk them with that heavy last hit of the 3. And as that primarily works through base damage, you kinda need to level the 3. But what you can also do is level the 2 after the 1. In that case, you deal a lot more damage with the dash and the knock up, and that way you can definitely get a higher burst combo, and you also slow enemies more. Likewise, consider if you want to level the ult. Sometimes it's worth it, sometimes it's not. If you're going for a lot of the shred ults, the high ranking ults, basically the combo ults, then you get a lot of benefit out of leveling the ult because it's more percentage damage, but in some situations it just seems that you're better off leveling other abilities. I would always prioritize the one though, even over the ultimate. And then a quick word on item choices, please, please, please build Gladiator's Shield when it makes sense to do so. If you have three physicals on the enemy team, you get a lot of benefit out of this because you have six abilities to rotate all the time and then two more sometimes that will all give you sustain that way, so it's almost unavoidable to build it. Likewise, when you're in jungle, the same thing goes for Crusher, and I typically actually build Crusher before Gladiator's Shield in jungle. It definitely drastically increases your gank potential and your burst potential because some base damage on the abilities isn't the highest, but with the addition of having Crusher in there, you have a lot of extra ticks that give you extra damage throughout with every ability that you use, and that really hits hard over time. I know sometimes you need Brawlers, and in that case I'd probably recommend building both, even though it leaves you a little less tanky, but in other situations Crusher is pretty much almost mandatory on him, and no other item in the penetration power area comes even close to what he can get out of Crusher. For survivability, when you can fit it in, Blackthorn Hammer is also an excellent choice and he's one of the few guys where that's true. It depends on the matchup, it depends on if you need more defense or health, often you will need other items like Voidstone or like Ancelia or something, really depends. Always a bit bruiser, but Blackthorn, in my opinion, has been working very well in many situations for me, so I wouldn't want to miss it when I don't have to. And now on the topic of the clunkiness of his basic attacks. Titan Chaos made a long post on this explaining why it works the way it works. I also proposed something that could be done about that. I would prefer a moving forward binding to the lunge instead of the current interaction. 
We'll see how that develops and apparently Hyrus is changing some things about that as well and that will change certain interactions. If you want to read that, I will link it below. I was going to go through it, but it would drag out this video for a very, very long time. So feel free to check that out yourself. It is pretty interesting if you're interested in the mechanical side of things. Again, I have multiple other videos talking about King Arthur and how to play him and how to do certain things with him and how item interactions work. Feel free to check those out. They will be linked here at the end screen. And that's it for today. I hope this was interesting and insightful. If you're new to the channel, feel free to smash the subscribe button. And other than that, see you for the next one tomorrow. Duke Sloth, out.